Well, good afternoon. Thank you for standing by and welcome to the re Powering Through a Pandemic. My name is Emmett Owens and I represent the Research Triangle Cleantech Cluster. And I wanna begin by thanking you all for joining us. I know this conversation focused on how COVID-19 is impacting the energy sector will be very enlightening to everyone who's joining us. I especially wanna thank Cisco for the technology to help us host this webinar for their investment in RTCC as one of our keyboard members and their leadership in energy and the related industries. I also wanna point out our event partner, the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association. For those of you who are not familiar with NCSEA, they are the leading 501c3 nonprofit that drives public policy and market development for clean energy. Um, their work enables clean energy jobs, economic opportunities, and affordable energy options for North Carolinians. You can learn more about NCSEA at energync.org. Before we get too far into the event, I wanna take care of a few housekeeping items related to the webinar. During today's event, attendees will be in listen-only mode. We've reserved about 20 minutes for Q&A towards the end of today's call. Uh, if you have a question during the discussion, we're gonna be leveraging the Q&A panel. Um, you should see this in full screen mode uh, on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, if you do not see the panel, you can click the more options icon that uh, it has an ellipsis on the bottom of your screen. Um, please type your question into the dialog box and select the send button um, and and direct all your questions to all panelists so I can uh, filter those to Paul during the Q&A session. Um, as a heads up, we are recording this event to share with others. And uh, we want to thank you for your participation and your good humor as this is our first uh, live webinar. Before I turn it over to Paul, I want to do a little provide a little information about the cleantech cluster and who we are. We are a membership driven nonprofit focused on accelerating the growth of the clean of the clean tech sector in the research triangle in North Carolina. Um, we wouldn't be here without our members. And I want to encourage you to check out our website at research triangle clean uh, to learn more about us. Additionally, we're in the middle of a three year grant focused on creating the North Carolina clean tech corridor with our accelerator partner in Charlotte Jules. Um, you can check out their website at our website at uh, ncleantechcorridor.org uh, to learn more about what we have going on. I also want to make you aware of several upcoming events you're hosting in the next couple of months and in the uh, somewhat distant future as well. So thank you all for being here. I'm going to kick it off to our wonderful moderator. Paul Quinlan, who is going to, to lead this conversation. So Paul, <clears throat> you can take it from here. Thank you, Evett, and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Paul Quinlan. I'm a clean tech manager at Scott Madden. If you're not familiar with Scott Madden, we are a general management consulting firm. Uh, we have offices in Raleigh, Westboro, Massachusetts, and Atlanta, and most of our clients work in the energy sector. Uh, very pleased to be here today to moderate this, this discussion with four great speakers. We'll, I'll introduce those folks in a second. But Emmett, if you can go to the next slide. If you had told me back in January that I would be barricaded in a bedroom in my house with three young children on the other side moderating a webinar, I would have thought you were crazy, but here we are. And it actually feels kind of normal at this point. So uh, what you can see now on the screen is what January looked like. This is the, the New York Times front page from January 11th, 2020. And you can see where the headlines were and these might seem like distant memories at this point. There was some challenges going on. Go back one, there you go. Uh, you, some challenges going on with um, Iran at the time and Nancy Pelosi had not even sent articles of impeachment to the Senate and bushfires in Australia were a big news item. If you, and in this, uh, the reason why I picked this date is because on page eight, A6 of this issue, uh, there was one headline that said, China reports first, first death from new virus. And so that was one of the, the first times that uh, COVID-19 or the coronavirus appeared in the New York Times. And if you fast forward to the next slide, you can see the headline from today, we've less than three months away and the news is just dominated by COVID-19 or the coronavirus. Uh, so much so that the image in the middle here, I don't know if the New York Times has ever had an image that goes up into their nameplate where they list the New York Times, but unfortunately that's the, the graphic of uh, for New York City on some of the challenges that they're facing. So what we're seeing is that um, this is this is a very slow moving and tragic natural disaster and it's very different from other types of natural disasters that we've had whether it's hurricanes earthquakes floods, or tornadoes 
In all the more typical natural disasters that we see, energy consumption is often at the forefront of emergency response. We make sure that gas stations have supply lines that are not interrupted and that folks can get gas. Electric utilities prioritize restoring power and will borrow out of state resources to get the job done quickly. But this global pandemic is, is very, very different. We're in an era of social distancing and a growing number of places in the US, there is a great strain on the public health system as everybody is aware. So even though energy is not on the front lines of this natural disaster, uh, this challenge is still impacting the energy sector. And I think we can briefly highlight this with two graphs. Um, this first graph here is um, some, some charts that are being produced by Scott Madden. They're on our website. They're updated daily. And what you're seeing here is electric demand in New York City. And so quick orientation, the gray bar on the top, that's a five-year time period, last five years. That's the min and the max. And the blue dotted line in the middle is the average. And what we've done is we've looked at seven day moving averages for this chart. So that gives you a sense of historically where we've been. This data is not adjusted for weather. So there's a, there's that element there. But the black line, what that shows is, is demand, seven day moving average for demand this year today. And you can see 2020 has been kind of tracking on the lower end, but since the WHO issued its pandemic declaration and then New York issued a shutdown order, Demand has been on a, a downward trend uh, since then, has not actually plateaued yet in this data set. And if you're interested in seeing more of these, we have a number of RTOs and ISOs up on our website. Um, also, the, the EIA just recently, just yesterday, put out their short-term energy outlook. And as um, taking a more macro view, they estimate that U.S. electric power sector generation will decline by 3% in 2020. So we're definitely seeing a decrease in demand. If you go to the electric demand, and on the next slide, it gives a sense of how things look in the gasoline sector. So this is demand for motor gasoline. For anyone who likes data and charts, uh, this era is fascinating because the charts coming out of this time period are, are amazing. So you can see here, demand for motor gasoline has dropped. It brings us back about 25 years in terms of where demand has been recently. So um, lots of changes in the energy sector and the goal of today's webinar is to have a robust discussion about that. We've got uh, four great folks that are going to offer insights. Each one person brings a different perspective. So I'm going to e introduce each person by uh, name, title, and organization. I believe Emmett has sent out some additional background on their bios to view offline. So if we go to the next slide, Emmett. Our panelists today will start. Uh, we've got four folks. I'll read their names left to right here. Renee, Renee Pete. Vice President and Marketing and Communications for Measurement and Control Solutions Growth at Xylem. Mary Ratcliffe, Vice President of Market Development and Innovation at ABB Power Grids. Nick Rao, Executive Director, Research Triangle Energy Consortium. And Ivan Erdlob, Chief of Strategy and Innovation, North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association. And so they will uh, be sharing their insights and comments today. The way we're gonna structure this is we'll break up, have some moderated questions broken into two parts. First part, we'll look at what's happening now, and then second part, we'll transition to uh, likely the response and long-term implications, and then we'll uh, move to audience questions from there. So with that backdrop and that setting, I'd like to start, and uh, Gary, I'm actually going to start with you. <clears throat> We're talking about energy today, which is a big topic, includes electricity and oil and gas. But to focus in with electricity first, what are the challenges that you're seeing that electric utilities are facing? And how are they responding to COVID-19? Sure, thanks, Paul. Um, so the top utility challenges typically in include service continuity, workforce health and safety, maintaining customer service, managing supply chains, in this case, mitigating financial impacts and, and cybersecurity. I don't want to talk about all of those, but I want to you know, reinforce a point that you made regarding the lower energy uh, usage, particularly in, in New York City uh, or the New York area. So New York has dropped about 20% their weekday demand, and we're seeing other uh, decreases in demand around the country, although typically not as uh, significant as the drop in New York. And this is largely, again, commercial and industrial load during during weekdays. The impact to utilities is there's a loss of revenue 
associated from this reduction in, in demand. And this is a bigger impact for those utilities that have volumetric rates versus decoupled rates. In New York State, it is decoupled rates, which does mitigate some of that, some of that impact. The other thing to think about when you look at the decrease in uh, power consumption is typically power consumption has been linked to economic activity. We've seen some economic growth recently with flat power consumption, mainly because of energy efficiency gains that we have seen. But when you see that significant of a drop in uh, consumption of electricity, usually there's an economic impact. The other thing that utilities are focusing on is the operational impact, prioritizing work, maintaining network operation centers, and supporting remote operations. For example, the New York Independent System Operator is actually having its operations staff live, sleep, and work on site uh, to isolate them from general public and any potential threats of uh, getting, getting sick. And uh, all the utility executives I've talked to over the past three weeks have said their companies are focusing on core operations, making sure the lights stay on. The good news is the grid power really hasn't been in the news. The lights are staying on. And uh, so that, I think that's a, that's a positive. Some of the things utilities are doing though, exploring position flexibility, maintaining critical operations, doing scenario planning around the potential loss of workforce. Uh, they are focusing on the core operations, as I mentioned, but they still have to meet statutory, statutory filing deadlines for distribution planning, electrification planning, and other mandated uh, plans uh, from their commissions. And then they're also wrestling with how to, how to change or how to address work practices. How do you address work practices uh, with COVID-19 uh, PPE without compromising the normal uh, protection equipment that the employees are, are, are used to uh, in, the, you know, in the course of their work. So in other words, how do we address the social distancing, for example, without compromising employee health and safety on, on the job? And then finally, just a, a comment in terms of positive response by the utilities. Uh, they are suspending for the most part disconnects during this time, and many are helping their local communities with financial donor donations for either COVID-19 response, responses or uh, donating PPE supplies for health workers. Great, thank you, Gary. Uh, next, I want to transition to Ivan, and Ivan, interested in looking at drilling down a little bit to the renewable energy and battery storage sectors. Um, these are, are spaces that were really hitting their stride at the end of the last decade. What challenges do you see COVID-19 posing to the continued growth of renewable energy and Yeah, thank you, Paul. And um, it's been really interesting, uh, some of the same uh, that Gary just mentioned for the utility sector, and um, then uh, some others surprising in, bo in both directions as I've reached out and spoken to firms uh, across the space and uh, done some additional research for today. Um, generally, um, the, the big themes, uh, decline in sales right now is being experienced pretty much across the board for distributed energy resources uh, for firms uh, that are selling solar panels, um, EV uh, charging in the home, uh, battery storage uh, behind the meter. Um, we're certainly seeing um, rising and less certain soft costs uh, for uh, these assets, uh, for these systems, installations. Um, there's uh, slowing and unpredictable zoning, permitting, and construction timelines. Um, we are also seeing firms are generally having difficulty with workers being able to come to work. Um, not, not, right, not yet, like um, huge portions of the workforce across the nation. Certainly, there are hot spots in the nation. Um, but there has been a, a noted and pretty consistent across the industry uptick in, um, in that. Also, uh, challenges with holding on to workers as um, firms are making their assessment of um, their financial liquidity and, um, and how to navigate a, um, a sustainable financial path forward amidst uh, near-term uh, decline in sales. Liquidity issues seem to really vary by firm and business model, not by technology or resource type. 
And, um, and I think that has a lot to do, uh, especially where firms are maybe more integrate, integrated and have finance and uh, kind of self-capitalize their business internally more. Um, they're not facing as uh, significant, what I'm gathering from talking to firms, a significant um, an issue there. Uh, similarly, accessibility to capital also varies in the same way. Um, while uh, some, while there are some reports um, that there's a freeze on um, on new capital decisions right now, um, that that has a widely varying impact on industry depending on how they're positioned. Um, there's intense experimentation going on across uh, renewables and storage, both uh, for uh, Firm selling and uh, for permitting and uh, state and local governments, uh, especially around some of the things that Gary mentioned around uh, ensuring safety of um, workers uh, and uh, process as well as uh, consumers, especially when on site with a with a business or a residential consumer or a government uh, consumer. And um, that experimentation is in. Um, all the way into retaining workforce with things like um, uh, reducing salaries and uh, temporarily uh, to retain workers to try to hold on to crews. And I'll get to uh, in a few seconds why I'm mentioning that. But also creating alternative permitting solutions where industry and, and permitting entities um, are, are trying to team up and see how they can conform uh, to new safety um, practices and requirements and still be able to move permitting forward. Uh, policy uncertainty for the industry is really shifting from kind of the typical type of policy uncertainty that you might hear um, folks wring their hands about um, as it might flow through into their business, uh, uh, often around maybe big, big policies or uh, utility programs not really being maybe what they want, or they, they're not sure how to take advantage of a certain policy in the market, to much more fundamental needs, um, like being declared uh, essential industry, essential workers um, under these uh, state uh, declarations, uh, making sure that they do figure out, um, permitting is really becoming a, a central thing uh, to mention that again. But on the flip side, something that was really interesting uh, to kind of close out this section for all the above. Um, I I've been reading this and, and hearing it. There's a, there's a lot of thinking and there's a number of um, even supply chain surveys out of, out of countries like China and, and elsewhere to suggest um, that there may be reason to anticipate an actual rebound or resurge uh, for renewables, EVs, storage um, in late 2020 and 2021. Um, the decline in near-term demand, um, uh, already we have cost curves that were declining. So something to watch out for is an accelerating decline in costs. And uh, if that happens on the rebound, uh, once we get past uh, crisis management of the very mortal threat of uh, coronavirus um, across the, the using and consuming public, um, there's a real question of how many people will turn and, and how many businesses and local governments will turn to distributed energy resources like microgrid, solar storage um, uh, to actually procure it, to buy it and install it. And if so, we could actually be looking on the other side at um, a midterm um, to mid to late term bottleneck. Uh, also, if we end up with oversupply. Uh, with um, product actually available in the market, but people not buying in the near term or able to uh, consume it in the near term. Um, Oversupply supply could also trigger bottleneck. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. And some states and countries uh, and areas of countries have been taking a proactive posture to take advantage of kind of the finance, finance dynamics of this uh, relative to kind of keeping people at work. Um, but uh, in, uh, in what you might call the, the clean energy, the renewable storage area, um, but, um, but that's not common uh, for sure. So a lot of unanswered questions and a, and a lot to watch out for here in the, the immediate term and the midterm potentially um, being a, a quite a roller coaster. Great. Thank you, Ivan. <clears throat>
And now I want to transition a bit and move over to, to oil and gas to get a snapshot on what's happening there. Um, and this question is to Vic. Vic, what do you see happening in this part of the energy space? Yeah, well, what's already happened is that uh, oil has plummeted. It's very similar to what happened in 2015. It dropped by about 50%. Uh, so it came down from about 55 to all the way to 21. It settled at 26 yesterday, something like that. There were two reasons for that. One is the COVID-19, but the other is the Saudi-Russian spat, I'll call it. Uh, and this is, the, the, the Saudi-Russian spat will eventually go away because the Saudis need $80 a barrel as an overall requirement for their social needs and so forth. Uh, the Russians need 40. So if you, with, with that in mind, that part will go away. So the part that, will probably not go away is the COVID-19 part for a while. And during that time, what's gonna happen? What the Saudis and Russians were trying to do was kill US domestic production, the what's the scale oil. Uh, I expect some of that will happen. I expect the more highly leveraged companies will go under and the big boys will buy them up at some, so many cents on the dollar. So I expect shale is not going away, it's just going into dormancy. I'm also expecting the price of oil to be somewhere between 30 and $50 uh, post recovery, but it may fluctuate for a while. So now what, so the, given the consolidations and the consolidation is gonna happen with the larger companies who, who have portfolios, uh, they'll be able to handle it. They have the balance sheets to handle it. So I don't see national, so scale oil is a national priority because it gives, the U.S. a measure of, uh, or at least the area, a measure of independence. The natural gas prices will go up. And I'm not going to go in detail. I'm going to tell you that if shale oil drilling drops, natural gas will go up in roughly second quarter, third quarter next year, and, and to some degree after that. And then finally, there's the question of demand destruction. Uh, due to the industry slowdown, that is demand destruction. But that is going to return. What we saw in the 2008-9 period, when industry came back, it took several years for demand destruction to, to come back. Uh, sorry, the destruction to sort of atrophy away. Uh, we don't know in this case what will happen. But the other part is the behavior change part. And we'll be discussing a bit of that later, which is that Change in behavior is a wild card that could in continue the demand destruction in oil. I'm done. Great, thank you, Vic. So, and a final kind of uh, question around what the current state and what is happening now. Renee, I'd like to talk to you about government's responses. Government has um, been leading the charge, state, local, federal, on the pandemic response. So how is COVID-19 affecting local governments in the U.S., and what have you seen in terms of recovery in China? And Renee, we can't hear you. You might be on mute. Sorry. Sorry for that. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'd like to build on some of the themes that Gary and Ivan addressed in their comments. I think what we see really laid bare is the interconnectedness of water and electric utilities and their connection to local governments. Each of these entities are incredibly dependent on the health of, of the other, and they are uh, inextricably linked to the health of the communities they serve. So as local governments and state governments are issuing these, these uh, no shutoff statements, as Gary mentioned, um, they're affecting the utilities. Um, demand is down. At the same time, um, revenues for the city are, are down and resources are down. What's, what's interesting in this is how water utilities are owned uh, largely in the United States. Water utilities tend to be owned and operated in the vast majority of communities in the US. So they are most, most of them are municipally owned. We see less of this on the electric utility side, but you do see this in the munis. So while the local governments under, are under tremendous pressure to respond to the pandemic, both from a health and safety standpoint, they're also under pressure from a fiscal one. 
Uh, many times one of the largest balance sheet items for a municipality will be the revenues from their water utility, for example. Um, you know, on top of this, they're stretched incredibly thin in managing their own workforce challenges. Um, some estimates vary, but based on custom, uh, customer conversations that we've been having um, with the utilities, their revenues are off anywhere from 15 to 40 percent. So, you know, as, as Vic and, and Gary and Ivan have suggested, there's demand destruction going on, but there's still this incredible focus for the local uh, governments to maintain health and safety of their communities and of their workers. Um, they're increasing their costs at a time where their revenues are down which is the really big story. Um, the other thing I think I would say is that as we've seen, if you look across the, the local news and the national news, you see that our local and state uh, governments are really taking a leadership role in the COVID-19 response. You know, this really ranges from their frontline role in maintaining health and safety to their ownership of utilities, as I've just mentioned, and providing those critical and essential services to people as they're, as they're trying to live under stay-at-home orders, orders. And advocacy at the national level for aid and recovery packages. And I'll talk about that a little bit a little bit later, but we see we see that a, a, a lot. There's been a lot of conversation at the state and local level of the need for uh, for recovery packages. Um, with respect to China, um, currently in our business, we're seeing a what I'll call a spring back uh, in both demand and productivity from our customers in our production facilities in China. It, it remains to be seen what will happen when the pent up demand from the lockdown is satisfied. But so far, our forecasts are stable. We can say that today looks encouraging, but we know that our current environment is incredibly volatile. Um, I think it's really interesting to look at a study, a recent study done by Visual Capitalist. I don't know if you've seen that site, but it, they, they do a great job of visualizing complex data. Um, they looked at several economic indicators and notably for the utility space, investment in fixed assets and industrial production were, were incredibly down year over year. Uh, it will be interesting to see uh, as China continues to pull out of the lockdown, if that investment springs back uh, in addition to the demand that is springing back. So that'll be an interesting thing to watch. Um, and it will be interesting to see what the government steps in to do to stimulate investment and the economy um, after their real first real contraction since 1976. So it, it was it was pointed out in the study that that the Chinese uh, economy had been growing steadily since then. So this is their first real uh, contraction and watching how they respond to it may be really instructive to the rest of us who are following following on. Excellent. Thank you. Sure thing. A lot of early learnings as uh, people look around the world for lesson learned. What I want to do now is transition to kind of a path forward and what is the likely response and long term implications of COVID-19. And Renee, I want to come back to you and, and maybe pick up on a thread that you just mentioned. You noted that investment is down in China, but from a, a bigger picture for the energy sector, how do you see capital expenditures being impacted? impacted by COVID-19 and the response that we're, we're having. Sure, uh, happy, happy to talk about that. In the near term, um, we see a mix of factors driving behavior, um, things from project funding that's dependent upon tax credits, you know, obligations to PUC commitments, uh, looming budgetary and operational challenges and declines in demand driving, driving just a wide range of, of behavior. It's, it's really on two ends of the barbell for us. Uh, in our own customer base, what we see is we've seen deployments accelerated because there are some of these utilities who are are racing to meet their existing PUC requirements uh, and also help out with their own work workforce management challenges. So the faster that they can get their deployments done to have remote monitoring, measurement and control of their networks, the better it is for their workforce and the better it is for their commitments to the PUC. Um, at the same time, we've seen uh, utilities really focus on 
getting back to basics and that critical infrastructure, you know, that Gary mentioned in his in his opening comments, they're they're really, you know, focusing on core business. And so we've seen some things put on hold. So it's really been dependent upon where utilities were in their deployments uh, and their assessment of technology investments. Um, what's for sure though is from conversations with our customers is that those who had already adopted these kind of remote technologies, um, for them, their world is much less impacted than those still using, using manual processes. Um, we've had conversations recently with folks on both ends of that spectrum. They're just much better equipped to protect their workforce uh, and their constituents while maintaining essential services. You know, in the longer term, as you know, as Gary and Ivan both mentioned, we can expect that there will be a need for follow on stimulus and recovery packages to state and local governments to assist in both maintaining public health and well being and recovering from the new strains on the services and infrastructure. And if you take a close look at recent statements by the National League of Cities, EEI, and the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, you can see that associations across the board are raising alarms on the effect of COVID crisis on our nation's utilities and critical infrastructure. They're calling for massive stimulus and investment at all levels. Um, so, so it's interesting to see because it does this mean that there's another opportunity for us in the longer run as there was uh, in 2009 after the 2008 uh, crash to build and invest in our infrastructure. So the longer term is, is looking uh, very, uh, very interesting. We'll be, we'll be interested to see what happens with these efforts. Excellent. And Renee, I want to piggyback and ask a quick short follow-up question. You mentioned some clients um, that have, I think you phrased it as remote protocols, are in a better position today than others that have not. Can you give just one, one example, one or two examples of which, what that may look like or what that is? Sure, just very simply, they don't have to send their, if, if they've got remote, remote sensors out or they're doing remote, remote reading, they don't have to send people out into the field and they can still do their, their billing, they can still do their um, observation and maintenance, they can get their crews out effectively and in a timely manner. It's, it's really just all those things around efficiency gains uh, and allowing them to work with um, fewer, fewer employees. You know, all, our utilities are also suffering from people calling in sick, um, reduced workforces. So how do they maintain uh, with, with fewer people? You know, for example, we had, we were talking with one utility that's still working on paper-based systems and they're, they're struggling how to figure out their workforce management. How do I do that on paper if, if, if what I was relying upon is a whole group of people having to come into a shop, get their piece of paper, and then go out into the field? For the folks that are doing that uh, digitally, they don't have to expose as many people uh, and put their workforce at risk. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I want to transition to Gary next, and Gary pick up on a, a thread. Um, Renee started with um, back in 2008, the last major recession we had a very large fiscal package that was passed during the Great Recession. Within that, there was a very large piece of money that was allocated towards the energy sector. Uh, the buzz phrase back then was shovel ready. Um, can you look back at first, give us a quick snapshot of, of what happened in 2008, 2009, and then um, bring us forward to today. There's been three COVID-19 bills that have passed. There's now discussion of fourth and energy keeps being percolating as a possible um, potential piece of phase four. Can you can you tell us what happened in 2008, 2009 and, and what we may see kind of on the policy front uh, today? Sure. So uh, back in 2008, 2009, that's actually when I first started working in smart grid technology and grid modernization. But following the recession, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, also known as ARRA, was implemented basically to stimulate the economy. But this package or this act included $4.3 billion plus matching funds for smart grid and grid modernization investments. Uh, the goals were basically to advance grid technology and also to create jobs that would help the economy recover. I would say much of the funds uh, 
probably went into advanced metering infrastructure, referencing your shovel ready technology, which could be quickly deployed, create the jobs and also move the needle in terms of modernization of, of the uh, utility grids and really take a, a big step forward in terms of moving towards digitization and digitalization. So today, if we fast forward, I think we have a similar opportunity. If there is a phase four or post COVID-19 stimulus package, uh, including infrastructure investment, in my opinion, as part of a package could address grid modernization that would improve grid reliability, grid resiliency, grid efficiency, and could also accelerate deployment and integration of renewable carbon-free generation. I think uh, specifically this investment could increase the, the grid's ability to host more carbon-free generation, whether it's at the transmission level as part of centralized generation resources, or whether it's at the distribution level as part of distributed energy resources. Again, with all the, all the while, the focus needs to be on you know, the economic stimulus you know, creating creating more jobs. There's also been some other infrastructure investments uh, with everybody working remote, uh, with schools trying to do things remotely. There's perhaps a, a driver or an issue to make investments in rural broadband. But I also think grid resiliency and efficiency are, are, are key investment areas. Great, thank you. Um, next, I want to move on to, to Vic. Vic, you mentioned uh, the plummeting of oil prices price of gas at the pump has become incredibly cheap at the moment. Uh, in addition, we have automakers that are converting their lines to make ventilators. Um, what do you see happening in the electric vehicle space? Similar to renewables and storage, this was a sector that was really getting a footing and um, starting to ramp at the end of 2020. How do you see this playing out for electric vehicles? And Vic, you too might be muted. I am. Sorry about that. Uh, well, I'll start with the bottom line, which is that uh, the, I don't see a material impact. And now I'll give you my reason. Energy, the, the total fuel cost, take a gallon equivalent of uh, electricity, of electric car. The total fuel cost for a gallon equivalent will be about, depending on what assumptions you want to make and when you charge, 25 cents for a gallon equivalent, which is a pathetically small number. Uh, now, even if you made the assumptions different and made it 40 cents, it's, it's not going to make much difference. So where is the issue? The issue is in the battery cost, the fixed cost of the battery. And when you amortize that cost, then it adds to the real cost uh, per gallon equivalent. The, today, it, it, we've done an amazing job in getting the battery cost down. And today, uh, Elon Musk is saying that by next year, I think he even said this year, uh, that it's going to be $100 per kilowatt hour. $100 per kilowatt hour, as many of us think, is the sort of tipping point at which things really have start to happen. At $100 per kilowatt hour, making various assumptions, I'm going to tell you that the break-even cost for a 200-mile range vehicle is for gallon equivalent is going to be about buck fifty. That is a pretty good number for most of the U.S., even at relatively low oil prices. <laughs> It's a hell of a good number for California, and it's an amazing number for Europe. So if you look at it in those terms, even if buck 50 holds up as the break even uh, for a 200 mile range vehicle, uh, it, it, it will not be the reason that people uh, will buy or do not buy. So, so that is what I'm saying is that <laughs> if that holds up and roughly my 30 to $50 oil price holds up, then gasoline, price reduction is not going to be the reason for any material impact on the electric field. So where will the impact come? I see, and this is not a direct answer to your question, but I see the impact coming on oil and gas companies. They, they will be compelled to diversify now into electric. They've been kind of playing at it. They've been doing some solar, some wind. I think they're going to have to go into it big with high, to give them some optionality that if there's a, if there's a, if there's a more of a quick uptick in EV, they should be able to handle it. And about the only way they can handle it if they're already present. And to me, geothermal is the place. I'm not going to go in details, but geothermal today has, has become scalable. And I think oil and gas companies should go into geothermal energy, give them optionality in the event the electric vehicles really take off. I'm done. 
Great. Thanks, Vic. And I'd like to remind the audience, if you have questions, please send them in through the chat box. I have one more for Ivan before switching over to audience questions. Um, I've been moving back to the policy side, maybe a little more at the state level. A number of states have either suspended or postponed legislative sessions, and this follows a number of states moving towards 100% clean energy commitments. Uh, regulatory commissions often hold hearings with a lot of people in a room, and that's a little more challenging in an era of social distancing. So what do you see as the impact of COVID-19 on both the legislative process and regulatory proceedings kind of in the near term here and even further out? Yeah, great question. Uh, so I uh, come through um, a repository of various um, statements, directives, orders, et cetera, on the NABRIC website this morning for 50 states and U.S. territories and um, looking for how they've uh, modified regulatory schedules process as well as um, disconnection, shut off, or, or um, essential service um directives or voluntary direct uh incur voluntary encouragement to utilities uh, so i got some numbers on that as well as um national conference of state legislators has a great page on uh, updates on um state legislative schedules so i did some uh, tabulation on on what's going on there and, and i and i think there's a, a couple interesting things that come out of that so uh, 24 um, U.S. states, uh, state legislatures have uh, postponed uh, their 2020 legislative sessions uh, by some amount, typically uh, with the exception of three uh, to some date in April. So presumably they, uh, a large majority of them may need to come back and do a further postponement. Uh, you have uh, 13 that have already adjourned sine die, uh, meaning that, uh, they probably don't intend to come back um, before the election. Um, so we might need to be on the lookout with them for specifically to COVID-19. Um, right there, that's uh, that's 37 states, and, and then uh, the remainders four don't have a session in 2020, and um, two have already uh, started. New Jersey and Pennsylvania have already started experimenting with remote participation in voting. So it'll be really interesting to see if um, they provide some uh, experimental lessons learned for other state legislatures that may enable them to get down to business uh, remotely, as opposed to waiting um, to be able to be together in person. But of course, there's other legal considerations that vary by state for that. Um, uh, we also then see on the um, on the uh, disconnects shutoffs. Um, this is uh, some interesting uh, information. Uh, 15 states uh, have ordered uh, a moratorium. Uh, either from the executive, from the regulator, or from the legislative, um, that utilities um, suspend disconnects, and uh, two have done that not for energy, but uh, one for water, one one for uh, broadband. Um, and then there's uh, four states, and DC have gone further and really um, looked much deeper into the longer term experience of the utility and their customer not just suspending disconnects, but really looking at payment plans and, and directing utilities to development payment plans for arrearages um, and, and, and a number of other considerations like keeping track of and reporting uh, their COVID related costs uh, back to the regulator. Um, and, and so that may also be a uh, experimentation area to look for uh, that more states may require. Well, we only have six that have strongly encouraged utilities, and I think that was fine for them because pretty much all their utilities volunteered and uh, maybe beat them to it uh, politically. Uh, so they didn't need to mandate it, and it would just not look good for the utilities if they mandated it. Um, and uh, five uh, have some number of their utilities just going ahead and volunteering. And then you have Oklahoma by itself and uh, maybe still in the space of examining their options. Um, and, and so I found that really interesting on the disconnect, just because at risk populations uh, uh, overlap so significantly uh, with people that could be uh, facing um, uh, these disconnect uh, issues. Uh, lastly, also on regulatory process, kind of the big things we're seeing, uh, moving to electronic whenever possible, hearings suspended, uh, public meetings, uh, stay at home orders, uh, really that a lot of commissions are figuring out how to make the transition to electronic and virtual. 
and how that how they can conform to existing constitutional or statutory or regulatory rule requirements, practices, processes they have in place. And, and so there's uh, quite a panoply of uh, approaches in play out there um, that are really customized to each uh, kind of state's regulatory um, construct and, and situation. Uh, and the closing note, I think, is on elections. Um, this is an election year. This is a big election year. Lots of legislators wanted to go home and were signaling and planning to go home early. And here we have half of them delaying their start of their process. Uh, so what are they going to do uh, with this uh, intensified, condensed period of time if they stick to that desire to be home ahead of election and uh, working on election, uh, which faces its own uh, COVID challenges? Um, and do the do the business address the business of the people um, with this whole additional layer of COVID um, that they need to give attention to uh, as well as regular business. Uh, so it's going to probably be some very intense punctuated legislative sessions would be my guess, and um, seeing what they can kick to uh, post election um, during lame duck sessions and so forth. Great, thank you, Ivan. Um, I want to get to some audience questions. My request to the panelists is for uh, consider this a lightning round, uh, quick answer. So maybe we can get through uh, as many questions as possible. Um, Renee, a question is: even though consumption has dropped, the way we now consume it has changed. The commercial usage has shifted towards more intensive residential demands, with so many people staying home, aka internet usage. Have you seen this or seen studies that um, support this? Uh, shift in, in consumption. Um, thank you. Yes, the, even, even if the consumption shifts to residential, the impact is, is, is not big enough to make up for that CNI drop. If you look at most utilities, most of their revenue, most of their consumption comes from commercial and industrial applications, stores, um, manufacturing, hotels, et cetera. If these things are shut down, the vast majority of consumption goes down. Think about um, weekend. We're basically on a steady state weekend usage now. Uh, the, the bump that we're getting from internet is doesn't even begin to replace the loss in demand from the, the commercial industrial user. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Ivan, this is uh, to you for a short answer. Uh, do you think the pandemic will change utility thinking on resili resiliency and will this encourage microgrid deployments? And you can even make that more broad, just distributed um, generation in general. I certainly am going to be looking out for how much um, uh, people um, thinking about shared economy and enjoying the products and services of shared economy may, may shift to a uh, self-sufficiency and resiliency economy and um, not sure I'm, I've, I've been doing reading uh, this week looking for signs of that um, feels like uh, the jury's still way out on uh, on exactly how that might materialize but um, certainly um, there's going to be some motivation as we get into natural disasters with fire and hurricanes and so forth for uh, portions of the nation and the world um, to start to go in that direction of self-sufficiency and, and uh, resiliency. Excellent. And then uh, I want to have one last question here for all the panelists. Uh, again, the request is a short answer, then we'll turn it back over to Emmett. And the question is, numerous articles have noted that global and the global pandemic will permanently change the way we live and work. And so in your mind, uh, thinking just about the energy sector, do you think that will hold true? And if so, what do you think is the one thing that will permanently change in the in, in the energy sector uh, going forward? Uh, and maybe we'll start with Gary on this one. Uh, so permanent changes to the energy industry. Um, I guess I look at two things, and we've talked about both of them today. Electrification, particularly electrification of transportation, and then also the transition that we're seeing to carbon-free generation. I think both are going to continue to move forward, uh, maybe slowed a little bit, particularly electric, uh, electrification and transportation because of lower gas prices, and Vic addressed some of those issues. But I think both are going to move forward, uh, and that, uh, that's not going to change. Great. Thanks, Gary. How about you, Vic, next? 
So I think that uh, companies that never did it will suddenly find remote working is working. They will find that virtual meetings are working. So I think the big winners out of this will be IT connectivity companies, because I think it will continue. Once something works and it's less costly, it will continue. The, some of the losers will be transportation, airlines in particular, because business travel is the, is the most lucrative. So, and greenhouse gases will improve because of that. So, <laughs> so putting it that way, that, that's the grab bag. Thank you, Vic. And Renee, how about you? Um, it's it's really interesting. I, I agree with uh, Gary and, and Vic's uh, sentiments on this. Uh, what I will say is uh, this crisis has really laid bare our weaknesses and our appalling inequities in our society and our world. And we have the opportunity to be better citizens, to be more engaged in our collective well-being. Uh, we have the opportunity to reassert the role of science, reason, good governance in civil society. And I'm really encouraged by all the optimistic and hopeful writing that's going on across the board in that regard. Uh, my hope is that we act on that optimism and those hopes for all our sakes. Great, thank you. And Ivan? Yeah, so uh, um, I'm really fascinated by uh, thinking about periods of time in history where the common common consciousness was all focused on a, on a, on a similar topic, like the Great Depression. And I grew up hearing stories um, from, um, you know, the greatest generation and and, and uh, others about um, like being really uh, reuse everything, um, be thrifty, you know, so on and so forth. Um, this is longer than a 20 habits are formed in 21 days. Um, this is much longer than 21 days uh, for a lot of the human population. Um, some of the habits that I think could serve us well, um, keying off of uh, Renee's comments, I think is that we're having very common discourse where people are showing that they can receive, digest, and apply in their personal and business lives science, um, basic math, um, uh, related to their their core values, their personal values, um, and, and 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 adapt and and take on and dialogue about this challenge to adapt. That's exactly the recipe of behavior um, that we need for AI, uh, for carbon, uh, and for a lot of these systemic shifts, um, and, and especially the two that Gary was talking about that he thinks are going to take off. Um, so I'm I'm really curious to see uh, if I'm if I have rose-colored glasses on or not. Excellent, thank you. Um, thank you all to the panelists for joining us today. I'll make one note that we as a group agreed that we would do video for this. And so I hope that the video has made it to the other side of the internet to all the viewers today and that it worked on your computers. Um, and thank you to RTTC for um, hosting this webinar and pushing us all to this new um, remote uh, world that we're living in. So thank you all. I would normally ask the audience to clap, but I'm sure they're all appreciative. And with that, I will turn it back to Emmett. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for leading such a great conversation. And thank you to Ivan and Renee and Vic and Gary for their time as well. We really appreciate it. And it's great to have this conversation. It's kind of, if you're familiar with the uh, um, uh, Green Tech Media, it's kind of like having the energy gang, our own little regional energy gang. So I'm excited about it. Um, and thank you to everyone who's participated. And uh, as a reminder, here are some upcoming events that we're engaging with the RTA. Um, event that's taking place April 15th and 16th is focused on transportation, free for RTCC members. So if you have any questions, please let Grace, Susan, or I know. And thank you again, everyone. And I found five minutes in your day. So have a good day, everyone. <laughs>